Okay, it is uh, January 29, 2019. We are with Eugene from Los Angeles. Okay, Eugene, uh, can you, uh, if you don't mind, let me just do something, introduce you initially to your tweets uh, with Donald Trump. I want to show them your tweets. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, uh, this is, okay, here are you. Your recent tweets, you don't see the screen, but uh, recently, let's see, you, Donald Trump wrote, how does Dan Neg Dick Blumenthal serve on the Senate Judiciary Committee when he defrauded the American people about his so-called war hero status in Vietnam, only to later admit, with tears pouring down his face, that he was never in Vietnam an embarrassment to the country. And here is your response, which received about 11,000 likes, more than 1,000 retweets, which is impressive. And uh, you ask, how does faith bone spurs Trump have the audacity to call someone else out on their war record when Trump literally dodged the draft by getting two doctors to write fraudulent notes? This is ridiculous. And let me just show some of your tweets so that people can read. I am just browsing them here on the screen. Beautiful. Uh, I, I basically met you there under Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, let me show them my responses also. You are very impressive. And uh, here are mine. And uh, once I wrote in history books, uh, oh, okay, here it is, Donald, he shared his picture on November 2nd, and I wrote, in history books, you have already earned a very special corner for yourself as the most corrupt, most idiot, most racist, most narcissistic, most megalomaniac, and most lying president of the United States. Anyway, these are simple, uh, just ranting. Um, okay. Uh, let me share 10 seconds. You will see this when you watch. Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, let's talk. Oh. Okay. Okay. I'm listening to you now where, where, where we are. Okay. There. You are on the screen now. Uh, Eugene, um, tell me about your story. I learned that you had an interesting uh, event that you were blocked by uh, Donald Trump. And uh, those who do not know, can you shortly, briefly tell us about your little adventure with him? <laughs> Yeah, sure thing. Um, so I guess I'll briefly start from the beginning. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a physician scientist uh, who's interested in curing um, deadly congenital heart and kidney diseases in babies. Okay. Um, and so when I was in medical school at Duke, I actually did research uh, involving fetal tissue. Uh, but then because that research kind of um, uh, the mainstream media got wind of the research and kind of uh, was talking about it. Uh, Congress actually subpoenaed me uh, out of the blue. There was a congresswoman from Tennessee named Marsha Blackburn who issued me a, a subpoena. And they actually had two armed U.S. Marshals bang on my door after I was working in the hospital all night and just trying to sleep. They banged on my door, they gave me the subpoena in person. Uh, it was pretty scary. And then I had to, that, that kind of thrust me into the political limelight. I, I ended up having to defend my positions, my research, uh, my, my, basically like who I am in my life to the American people because the congressional Republicans were attacking me so severely. Yes. Um, then uh, I, it, as part of that political activism that I was thrust into, I uh, looked at social media. In, in the beginning, I had nothing on Twitter. Uh, I, I had zero followers or whatever, and, but I just began to protest against Donald Trump 
the Republicans in Congress against Marsha Blackburn uh, and Diane Black, all these Congress people who were, you know, attacking me so much. Um, and then I eventually found the space underneath Donald Trump's tweets um, where you could directly reply to the President of the United States. And it's, it's sort of like a, a community there. And I, you're part of that community. A lot of other people are part of that community where we just talk about why the president is hurting so many Americans. Um, and then uh, one day, I think it was in July of uh, last year, Donald Trump just out of the blue blocked me. Um, I, I wrote down something about how he doesn't proofread his own Twitter and uh, does, and, it, but, and isn't that scary because he's in control of our nuclear armed forces? What if he presses the nuclear button on, by accident? And mm -hmm. he blocked me, uh, and then I joined uh, a lawsuit against the president with the Knight First Amendment Institute uh, to get him to unblock us. And we how many, had a how many plaintiffs? How many plaintiffs were with you? Uh, I think there's about six, uh, six of us okay. uh, together. Uh, we're from all walks of life, uh, different career paths, but we're all united in our opposition to President Donald Trump, and we were, we were all blocked by him uh, for saying something critical of him. And uh, which federal court uh, took the case? Yeah, I think it's, uh, uh, I have to look it up. It's, it's a New York, uh, Southern District of New York okay. uh, federal court. Uh, so the, I think it's the same court that Michael Cohen Yes. Uh, Prosecuted okay, in. and then uh, how long does uh, did it take uh, for the result uh, for the decision? Yeah, the it, it, it took a few months. It was actually quicker than I anticipated. Uh, I think it took about um, five or six months oh. uh, for the federal judge to issue her ruling. Uh, it, was, uh, it was Judge Naomi Buckwald, um, and she said that the president cannot infringe upon our First Amendment rights uh, because. The, the space underneath Trump's tweets um, is a public Pu public square. Lovely. Yeah, that, yeah, like a public square. You can't you can't just ban certain people because their speech uh, is 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 uh, you know politically against you. You you have to make room for all types of political speech. I love country. that ruling. That's a very important ruling. And right. Especially this uh, president is trying to misdirect, misinform people through Twitter. Beautiful, and you are kind of a little bit not stereotypical activist because medical doctors <laughs> usually do not end up with this. And uh, I'm glad that you are there, you are voicing, uh, expressing uh, what many of us feel that this is just like a lie factory, he's manufacturing lies. It's pure fascist propaganda what he's using. The same tools, basically putting people against each other, tickling people's nationalistic hormones, and using also religion, getting uh, the religious right on his side, and uh, basically promoting racism and uh, fascism. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's very unfortunate because I think that what Donald Trump has tapped into is there's always a segment of the American population uh, that... Uh, are kind of discriminatory, you know. Uh, they're like uh, what there's there's a there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of racism in America, and, and and Donald Trump has tapped into the power of racism uh, in order to achieve everything he's done as president. And I think that's very dangerous. It sets a very dangerous precedent uh, in the United States, uh, and he's basically a demagogue, you know. Like he 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 preys upon people's worst instincts and riles them up. Uh, yep. in order to attain power. And that's, and, you know, uh, many other dictators in history have done that, you know, and, and he's following in their same footsteps. Yeah, if you, look, if you look at his company, for example, he, is, he has good relation with Putin, another dictator, with Modi of India, and with uh, Netanyahu of Israel, with the Turkish uh, dictator uh, Tayyip Erdogan, with the Saudi barbarian uh, bin Salman, he has good relation with all these dictator, authoritarian, or fascist people. And uh, therefore, uh, it tells us a lot about his inclinations. And um, very interesting, in this time in history, we see in Asia and Europe, we see these uh, racist, 
and authoritarian leaders get popular. And uh, I didn't have any kind of expectation that this country, or fear, uh, that this country will end up like this. Now, first time I have a little bit kind of possibility this country could repeat the history like Hitler did. Right, and, and, and speaking, speaking about the authoritarians and dictatorships, you know, I noticed that uh, you have a lot of experience, you, have, you know, you were born in Turkey, and then can you tell me a little bit more, I'm very curious about how, what happened with your family, with your brother, um, yeah. and, and all the persecution that you've experienced. Well, uh, mine was two-sided. I got from government and later I got from religious establishment, clergy, and uh, I was hurt by both. My only uh, guilt or uh, sin was to express myself, that's all. I didn't hurt anyone, I didn't cheat anyone. Uh, initially I was critical of Turkish government, that time I was not, my religious conviction was not like this, but I was right, the government was oppressive, was racist, fascist, because uh, there was also military coup, and um, therefore I got four year in prison, one year torture, Therefore, I have no, when I see someone trying to justify torture, I lose myself because it is the worst thing a, a human cannot do that. Anyone trying to justify torture by using any means, fear and stuff, that person doesn't have heart. And uh, also later, I rejected my parents' religion, which is Sunni religion. I was a best-selling author that time in Turkey. In fact, I was friend with today's Turkish dictator Tayyip Erdogan. We were together in school and also in the party, in the youth. I was uh, the president of the youth and he was uh, also in Istanbul. He was the president of the Istanbul group. But he was uh, under me that time and uh, the prime minister, previous prime minister, they were all, we were in one group. And then later I parted my ways with them when I saw that the religion I was promoting has nothing to do with the teaching of the Quran or Muhammad and Sunni or Shiite doesn't matter. There are major distortions. And the same happened with Christianity. Today's uh, uh, Protestant or uh, Catholic religions really have nothing to do with the teaching of Jesus because I studied uh, the Bible too. I have written two, three books on the Bible. And yeah, uh, yeah the messengers or prophets call, they come as a revolu revolutionary and their number one enemies in their time are religious clergymen. For example, Jesus, uh, you see in the Bible, Pharisees, they were number one opponents. Because clergymen use God's name in order to fool people, to exploit people, like the opium of masses. And when they also in cahoots with the political leaders, and we have two very powerful hormones to manipulate people. One is tribal, nationalistic now, tribal hormones, the other religious, and they both basically appeal to the emotions, raw emotions. And people stop reasoning and they are getting very kind of ready to be manipulated. Very good people can be turned to become murderers by pushing those two buttons. And they are led yeah. throughout history. Therefore, I am very kind of uh, alert against any politicians wave flags or wave holy book. There is something behind. They want to make people get intoxicated, take advantage. They either steal from resources while they hide their corruptions or their intentions behind the flag and behind the holy books. Yeah, it's very interesting the point that you bring up, and I agree with you. I think that when people manipulate other people's emotions, then we ignore evidence and the facts. Exactly. You ignore, you ignore the truth, and, and basically people become sheep who just Beautiful. follow their emotions that, that, uh, that the other people are kind of making them feel. Exactly. And, and then they're blind. They don't, they don't know what's going on. They don't know right from the wrong. The IQ level goes down. It becomes animalistic. We turn to animals. We will forget about even our self-benefit. And people look at the wars throughout history. Wars are usually declared by the, uh, by the 
leaders, rich people, who do not fight themselves. They are in their mansions, in their palaces, they enjoy, even their children do not go into the war. Even they go, they are in the back. They are in logistics right. to show their faces. But usually the children of the poor kill the children of the poor to make profits for the warmongers, either bring them money or fame, whatever they want, or they do distraction through this. And uh, therefore, uh, I, I don't know whether you listened to my speech at uh, British Parliament recently, uh, it was about a year ago, and I pulled attention to warmongers and uh, the wars, the, the military industrial complex, how we spend so much money on this, and then how they create excuses to declare wars or invasions in countries, how we kill millions of people. And therefore, we need to unify our voices internationally because these uh, noxious powers, which is right now multinational corporations, Eugene, they combine their forces, they are global, and they do their uh, vices globally. And we nationally, we cannot really fight them. And they are bigger than any nation right now. And they hijack the governments. And supposedly we have uh, democracy, but they pick the candidates, they support the candidates, they basically use the money as a leverage. They pick the candidates, elect them through us, and then if the candidate go against them, basically through money, either bribe or punishment through propaganda, advertisement, whatever, the candidate is gone. Therefore, they are right now controlling, unfortunately, uh, not 100% of course, but unfortunately they hijack the democratic process. And therefore, one of the major issues I believe that we need to focus on is campaign finance reform and perhaps through an amendment. We need to separate money from politics. You know, money we have separation of church from the state, Eugene, and we need to have separation of the corporate money, corporations from, corporations from things, and the Constitution is deficient right now. American Constitution doesn't have protection against big corporations. But big corporations is destroying us. Look at this. Three persons in the United States, three individuals, Bill Gates, Bezos, and Buffett, their, their wealth is more than 50% of Americans. That's there is crazy. something yeah. wrong here. Whatever excuse you bring to me, there is something okay. inherently wrong in this picture. You know, you know what I've noticed, and you know, it kind of builds upon what you said, is it's pretty scary, the state of democracy uh, in our modern world with globalization, with, uh, with increasing technology and social media. You would think that as the humankind, as, as, as our people, get smarter and technologically more advanced, that we would have stronger democracy. Right? That, that's, all, that's what I always assumed when I was little and growing up. I thought when the human, you know, when the human race keeps on getting smarter, we're going to get more equal, we're going uh, to help people more. But then what happened, it seems like with social media, um, people aren't getting more smart. It's more like a, a misinformation spreads very fast. People's emotions are riled up. Uh, without looking at the facts or evidence. Corporations are getting much bigger. They become more powerful than nations now. Um, and they control so much behind the scenes. They have so much money. They donate to the, the political candidates that you're, you're talking about too. So it's like we're, going, we're moving backwards. As technology is increasing, we're, we're becoming less democratic. We're, we're becoming controlled by very, very powerful people are able to control way more resources than ever before in the history of human civilization. It's like corporations have become emperors, global emperors. And, and this is a problem. And what do you think we should do to fix this? Because uh, the way that it's going, it's just getting worse. We're losing our privacy rights. Yeah. Like, I don't know if you've heard in the news recently, but um, there was this glitch uh, with, with, with FaceTime for Apple iPhones, where if you call someone with FaceTime, you can actually listen uh, to their microphone even if they don't answer the call. And, and, and that kind of made people realize, man, our phones, our, our, you know, the Alexa systems that we have, is always listening to what we're saying. We're always being watched. Like, I, I'm not trying to be paranoid or anything, but with increasing technology, of we're course. losing our privacy rights too. Of course. And, and our democracy. 
recently, for example, the First Amendment right now under attack in this Trump administration, recently some uh, states passed law basically banning, banning uh, anyone who promote BDS, you know, BDS movement, have you heard about it? Yeah, I heard a boycott, divestment. Divestment, yeah, uh, about uh, Israelis, against Israel's apartheid uh, system there. And uh, some states are banning this, means they are going to penalize anyone who promote BDS. This is absolutely a war against First Amendment. That's the very reason I am in this country. I'm not here for food, I'm not here for job, for anything else. I came here for freedom that this country had, which I am very grateful to God. And this is one of the best countries in the world, perhaps the best, regarding freedom. As long as a human individual has freedom, that's fine. It, things can be taken care of. And here it is, I see the attack to our freedoms during this administration's time. Therefore, we need to fight against this, of course, with reason, with good sense, not using the same kind of uh, hatred and warmongering. Uh, here is my suggestion for you. Um, my suggestion, try to run for next election. Uh, how old are you? I'm 32. Oh gosh, you are already eligible for that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I want you to think about, and I will uh, uh, have interview with other activists, at least on uh, uh, Twitter, because Twitter is a battleground of ideas. Right now it's very important. And... Uh, we may also come together, create a kind of a conference and meet each other. And because many of those who are active there, they don't meet each other, they don't have a real 3D biological connection, touch, at least face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, what do you think? I think that's a great idea. I think, yeah. uh, you know, there's a lot of action on social media. We, we, People can make tweets and, and uh, kind of meet each other that way, but I think there's no replacing actual face-to-face, -face in real-life interaction, and, uh, because that's how you really connect with people. We, you know, and, we're human beings. We're yeah. not used to just connecting with, <laughs> with like, you know, over the yeah. phone or, or online. We have to really you know, meet in, in, in person, and I think conferences... It's a great way to do that. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, uh, if you have some names, I have some names in my mind. Suggest me even now or later in text. Uh, uh, some activists you want me to uh, be in touch, and uh, we need to come together in a short time to have a conference. I will uh, organize that a conference. That's great. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, I, there's a, there's a lot of activists I think that would be interested, and it would be it would yeah. be an honor. To to meet them in person, I would be very excited. Absolutely, absolutely, because they, they, I think they are the real people. They are not over there to make money. They don't even have their real face and stuff there. I want to recognize those people more than those people who are there professionally doing this thing. Okay? And uh, tell me about uh, your, uh, uh, where you, were you born? Uh, I was born and raised in San Francisco, California. Oh, really? And your yeah. parents, tell me about your parents. Yeah, um, my dad was born in China, and he came here uh, for college, and my mom was born in South Korea, uh, came here for college, and they actually met at San Francisco State University, uh, okay. and then, um, you know, that, that's how I was born in San Francisco. Wow. Uh, I have one brother, uh, he was also born in San Francisco, um, and he is now in his last year of dental school. Beautiful. Uh, so, it's, I'm excited for him. Great. Uh -huh. I, my two <laughs> kids are there. Did you meet my two sons, Metin and Yahya? Both of them are in San Francisco, but you are right now in Los Angeles, correct? Yeah, right now, right now I'm in Los Angeles. If you I, go I to San Francisco, let me know. At least uh, you meet them. Yeah. And you are welcome to come to San. I will go. <laughs> we we'll go together to Saguara National Forest, whatever, and you will hug a cactus. <laughs> I, know, I visited Tucson one time when I was interviewing for residency huh. uh, right after medical school. I think there's University of Arizona. Uh -huh. um, 
And then uh, I love that, that your streets have these big saguaro cactuses yes. just lining the boulevard. Yeah. Usually there's trees. Uh, yeah, on that lovely. Side the, beautiful <laughs> sceneries, beautiful hiking <laughs> places stuff, okay? And you are invited, you are welcome. <laughs> and uh, you. Uh, you can stay at our, uh, we have a room here, the children's <laughs> room empty for three days. Fourth day, I need to negotiate with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> the one. Okay. Uh, anything else that you want to share? A few minutes. Let's see how many minutes we have. Okay, twenty. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I, you know, I, most people know me from Twitter, uh, but I actually started a new YouTube channel. Um, it's you can find it under my name, Eugene Gu, MD. Okay. Um, and uh, that's where I kind of discuss uh, the. You know, the tweets that I make underneath Donald Trump, I kind of elaborate it further. Beautiful. Because I think, you know, nothing can replace actual like, a video and, and, and making the arguments that way. Um, so I hope people can check that out too. Um, Great. And uh, I, will, uh, I will be kind of, uh, what's called, uh, subscribe to your... Subscribe, yeah. Yeah, I subscribe, the keyword. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm really small right now, but hopefully I just want to get the message out there about right. you know about our president. And yeah. I think you know Twitter is pretty powerful, but also moving to different platforms, you can reach different people, um, and, and I think it's important to do that. Uh, we may in the uh, near future we may have also a YouTube-based uh, news commentary and stuff like uh, there are a few of them, but we can have much more diverse and interesting one. We are thinking yeah, about that too. Great. Yeah, you will be a good programmer there. You will have <laughs> your own program, hopefully. Okay, nice meeting you, Eugene. Thank you, you very much. Me. This is not the last, but this is a good first interview. Uh, peace. Take care. You too. Take You're care. Welcome. Bye. Bye.